Psalms chapter 28. Tonight we're going to talk about love God's house again. You'll notice the outline in the slide says part three. Those of you that have been with us will realize that's what it is. Chapter 27 was part two. Chapter 26 was part one. We were actually going to pause in Psalms at the end of chapter 25, but I got so excited about the next three chapters talking about God's house that we decided to go just a little bit longer and deeper into the book of Psalms. But tonight we find ourselves in looking at Love God's House Again, Part 3 from Psalms 28. Uh, we're going to read the Psalms and then we're going to dive right into breaking it down and understanding the truth that it has to say for you and I. Psalms 28, beginning in verse number 1, and it reads like this, To you I will cry, O Lord my rock. Do not be silent to me, lest if you are silent to me I become like those who go down to the pit. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry to you, when I lift up my hands toward your holy sanctuary. Do not take me away with the wicked and with the workers of iniquity who speak peace to their neighbors, but evil is in their hearts. Give them according to their deeds and according to the wickedness of their endeavors. Give them according to the work of their hands. Render to them what they deserve because they do not regard the works of the Lord nor the operation of his hands. He shall destroy them and not build them up. Blessed be the Lord, because he has heard the voice of my supplications. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices, and with my song I will praise him. The Lord is their strength, and he is the saving refuge of his anointed. Save your people, and bless your inheritance. Shepherd them also, and bear Bear them up forever. A few things that we know about Psalms 98 in a way of a background is this. It was written by David. Most of you have your Bible and the subscript at the top of the chapter would tell you that this was indeed identified as David as the author of this chapter. It shows here that David, this David, the son of Jesse, once again crying out to God and praising God for hearing and answering his prayers. We really don't know what caused this problem that's going on in the life of David that he's lamenting about and that he's crying out to God about. We don't know exactly what it is, but it did involve according to this text, wicked people and workers of iniquity and deceptive people who pretended to be David's friends, but actually were those who turned on him and called for his ruin. Some Bible teachers you will read if you do much in-depth study on this chapter, some Bible teachers have tried to show that the period here of Psalms 28 leading up to, is leading up to uh, the period of Absalom's rebellion that it would fit the description of Psalms 28 but I disagree with that because why else would David pray for his own son's destruction when he asked for Absalom to be spared and we know that from verses 4 and 5 in this text and also 2 Samuel 18 but regardless of what Whatever's going on in his life, something tragic is coming against him, enough that he calls out to God. One of the reasons why I believe chapters like Psalms 28 are so important because all of us at some point in life are going to have our backs against the wall. At some point in our life, we're going to feel as if the world is against us. At some point in our life, we're going to feel like we're being treated unfairly or we're being accused unfairly or we have people, it seems like, on the right and left. Some of us might even unfortunately experience the pain of betrayal by a friend who said they loved us, but instead they were hoping and planning for our demise. That is the way life is. So Psalms 28 comes along and gives you and I some ways that we can not only make it through those difficult seasons, but also the ability to be able to grow through them, the ability to be able to know God better through these times of hurt and desperation. I divided it up into four segments. You'll see them in your outline. Segment one is about asking. Segment two is about asking. Segment three is about praising 
praising and segment four is also about praising. Let's look at the specifics. Number one is asking. Psalmist is asking to be heard by God. Let's read verses one and two again. To you I will cry, O Lord, my rock. Here David was feeling like he needed this from God, for God to be his rock, for God to be the one that would be his strong place, for him to be this rock in this difficult season of his life. David went on to say this, Do not be silent to me, lest if you are silent I become like those who go down into the pit. He needed God to be this rock, not to be quiet, but to be a rock, to be a foundation, to be stability for him. It's interesting I've heard it say in our culture where somebody will refer to their spouse, their husband or wife or a best friend as being their rock. Someone that was there rock solid for them during a difficult time in their life. But when it comes to Bible literature, every time rock is used in the Old Testament, it is in reference in Old Testament literature to deity, to God himself and never for man or never for a person. Intended for God to be a rock, to be literally a foundation, our stability and our security. When David goes on and calls for God not to be silent to him, toward him, we're not for sure what that's about, but I will tell you this, it's obvious that he feared God's silence more than he did the workers of iniquity, more than he did those that were around him. He wanted to know that God would not only hear him, but that God would respond to him. But there are those moments where we feel as if God is silent. There are those moments. I, I love it that we have this chapter that David wrote because it helps you and I relate to the fact that sometimes we feel as if God is silent. Uh, but some, uh, some have even said that it feels like the heavens are brass, that you can't get through, or that God's not hearing, or God's not listening. We all like to be heard. Every wife in the building just said, Amen. We like to know that your husband is listening. We like to know, wives, that you are listening when we talk. We like to know that when we talk to our kids and tell them what to do, that they are listening. Uh, we like to know that we are heard. I've even found in difficult conversations with people going through difficulty that though it doesn't solve their problem, it usually eases their pain just knowing that someone listened that someone heard their pain. Someone heard about their trouble. Here David is talking about that when he said, Do not be silent to me, lest if you're silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. He goes on in verse 2, Hear the voice of my supplication when I cry to you, when I lift up my hands toward your holy temple. David here calling on God is asking him to hear the voice of his supplications. That in the midst of this difficulty, he wanted God to hear him. I'm sure you've heard it as I've heard it often from people, from preachers rather, if you listen to very much preaching at all, that God's delays does not mean his denial. There are times that it seems like we pray and pray and pray and there seems to be no answer and there seems to be no return voice from heaven. But David shows us here very clearly that even in those difficult times, God is listening and God does hear us and we can have that kind of confidence. But notice in the midst of this difficult time, David's posture that he had, his heart and his mind were focused. His heart and his mind were focused on the house of God. Look what it says again there in this verse. It says, Hear the voice, verse 2 of my supplication, when I cry to you, when I lift up my hands toward your holy sanctuary. There is a repetition throughout the book, especially the book of Psalm. And then there's also repetition throughout the Old Testament and also the call in the New Testament not to forsake the assemblings of ourselves together. All of this repetition of gathering in the house of God ought to cause us to put new priorities rather in our lives to be in God's house and to redirect our lives to be in God's house, to love God's house again. Uh, 
it's interesting to me um, uh, when I begin as a pastor to talk about gathering in God's house. Obviously, you're here tonight, so you've made the decision for that. You've made the decision to be here. We're not talking about the fact that you're here now. We're talking about all the opportunities you're given to be in God's house and the, the minimal things that it takes to miss God's house. I shared with Pastor a statement that I'd heard a, a Church of God in Christ pastor make recently, and he said this, the problem with missing church is one day you will no longer miss being in church. That you just find it easy to not even go. There's no inkling of, a, ooh, I wish I would have gone to church today. Ooh, I wish I could have been there. Now listen, I am not talking about those moments when you just cannot be at church. That has nothing to do with it all. I'm talking about the, all of the many times that it's within our decision-making capability to be there and not be there. There's something to be said for it. Now, lest you begin to think too much off track here and believe this has anything to do with me as a pastor that somehow or another, Pastor Dan and I make more money the more you attend. It is not true. This is not a sales scheme by any stretch of the imagination. We don't get paid more if you come or don't come. There's nothing that happens to our resume to to fluff it up anymore or deflate it any at all according to your attendance or your lack thereof at church. It has nothing to do with that at all. Instead, it has to do with a pastor's heart that knows what's best and knows what God's Word says and is imploring with you, come to the house of God. Come to the house of God. I want to speak to our online crowd for some of those that have settled with just this avenue of having church, of sitting there and not coming out to church. I'm inviting you, come back to the house of God. Come back to His sanctuary. Come back to assembling in the midst of God's children. Here David in the midst of his difficulty, what was he thinking of? The holy sanctuary of God. There was something about wanting to be there. One of the privileges, and I count it as that, that I have as a pastor is the access I have seven days a week, 24 hours a day to this sanctuary right here. There are moments that most of my devotional time is spent in my my personal study that I have in my home is where I do most of my very early morning hours is when I prefer to do that and have my time alone with God. But occasionally when I drop my wife off at work, I drop her off around 20 to 6 in the morning. I'll scoot over here to the sanctuary and I'll put some praise and worship music on my iPhone and just lay it up here on the, on the table up here and I'll just begin to just walk around and just worship and praise God. And I'll begin to just think on God and the things of Him. And, and I'm not here trying to conjure up some kind of sermon. I'm in here to meet with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to meet with God. There is something special about the house of God. There is something special. And I'm here to tell you, dear saints, if you've lost the specialness, as I'm going to call it, of the house of God, get it back. Ask God for it again. Ask God to give you a love for God's house once again. David, even in the midst of a difficult time, in in his life had a love for the house of God. The second segment is also about asking. And this one, David is asking to be spared the fate of the wicked, to be spared the fate of the wicked. Let's read verses three through five. It says, do not take me away with the wicked and with the workers of iniquity who speak peace to their neighbors, but evil is in their hearts. Here, David is making a distinction while at the same time giving you and I a reminder. Here it is. The good of God's children is different than the evil of the wicked in this world. And God treats them accordingly. God treats them accordingly. We are, listen to me, saints of God, we are the children of God. But there are those that do not walk with God, not only just do not walk with God, but are opposed to God, opposed to the things of God. They are in the world 
words of the psalmist here. They are the wicked and the workers of iniquity. They are hypocrites in speaking peace to their neighbor, but evil is in their hearts. And listen to me, there will come a day when God will judge good and evil, when God will judge his children and God will judge this world. But until then, you and I are called to live as God's children in this world, in a wicked world, in a way that pleases God without being swept up in the wickedness of this world. Pause where we're at right there in Psalms 28 and go with me to Psalms chapter 73. Psalms chapter 73. I want you to see this with me because if we're not careful when difficulty starts happening in our lives, we will lose perspective. We will begin to think wrongly. David here is still in the midst of his trouble thinking with great clarity of good and evil and of those that are after God. God to serve him and pursue him and those who are opposed to God. Here we find in Psalm 73, this chapter was written by a man named Asaph. And we're going to begin in verse number one. And Asaph writes these words, truly God is good to Israel to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. Now pause right there for just a minute. When I'm reading that chapter and I get to that part, I'm I'm like, okay, here's someone who loves God, but he's saying that I almost slipped. I almost fell. I almost went the wrong way, at least at a minimum in my thinking. Very first thing I think of is, hold up here. Let's pay attention right here because he's about to teach me a lesson of how not to get off track, how not to get away from the things of God. And he does just that beginning in verse number three. Let's continue. He says, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pains in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression, and they speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walks through the earth. Therefore, as people return here, and waters of a full cup are drained by them, and they say, How does God know, and is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocent. For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. Then he says this, when I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. You know what Asaph is saying there? He's saying, God, it's unfair that my unsaved, reprobate neighbor got a pay raise at work for doing nothing, and I work 60 hour weeks serving you, God, with no pay raise. This is Asaph going so far as to say that even in death, they don't even have pain. What's he trying to say there? He's trying to say this. God, how come when I did 37 in a 35 mile per hour zone, I got a ticket. But my co-worker drives 60 to work every day in the same section of the road that's supposed to be 35 and has never once been stopped. Why, God? Why does it seem like I work hard and have nothing, but my neighbor, who's as sinful as he can be, has abundance? So much that the psalmist said his eyes bulge with abundance because there's just too much to hold it all. God, that's unfair. That's what caused him to almost slip and fall away. Until what? Until he came into the sanctuary of the Lord. Until he got in the presence of God. And then when he understood their end, not where they're at now, but the end, when he understood their end, it all made sense. Because here's the deal, ladies and gentlemen. You and I work for God on a delayed gratification scale. We don't live for pleasure now. And play now. 
We work now for our reward and our pleasure later. We work now on this earth until it's all said and done. Then we enjoy eternity with God in heaven above. This isn't playtime while we're down here. This isn't recess time. This is work time. And here Asaph had to be reminded of that. He had to be reminded that sure they're living wicked and sure I'm living good for God. But I need to remember that we all reap what we sow. That there will come a day when the harvest will happen and those that have done good will be equally rewarded. And those who have done evil will also be judged. I'm here to tell you folks, don't lose heart and don't get faint hearted. Keep your eyes on the prize. Keep looking to God. One day it will be worth it all. And David was trying to help you and I to see that very thing. He goes on back in Psalms 28 now. David aptly described the wicked by saying this, who speak peace to their neighbors but evils in their heart that they hide evil. He goes on, verse 4. He goes on to say, give them according to their deeds and according to their witness of wit, wickedness of their endeavors. Give them according to the work of their hands. Render to them what they deserve. David was calling for judgment to be given according to their deeds, according to their witness, wickedness, according to the works of their hands, according to what it is that they deserve. All of that reminds me of a few verses. Write these down. Romans 6.23 says this, For the wages... Did you notice that? Wages. Wages are what? Payment for something you worked for. The wages. Working at sin. Working at being sinful. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Another one to write down, Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. Paul writing to the church at Galatia, right before, right before this passage, he had shown them the works of the flesh and the fruits of the Spirit in comparison. Then he wraps it up by saying this, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Why did David pray for this, asking for their judgment? Verse 5, because they do not regard the works of the Lord nor the operation of his hands. What David is saying there is this, man may have forgotten about God, but God's never forgotten about man, ever. Those that do good and those that do evil. David's prayer here was not an expression of personal revenge or calling God for God to fulfill anything less than his covenant and to bring righteousness and peace into the land. There's a passage that I wanted to read to you from James Montgomery Boyce's commentary on Psalms. I found it so important I took the time to write it, to type it into the handout that you received tonight so that you can have this. It was the most out of my, all of my studies for Psalms 28, this was a profound paragraph that was written and I wanted to share it with you. And he writes this, Evil should not prosper. Regardless of how we may feel about those who do evil, and we should certainly try to save them and redirect them if we can, evil itself is not good. We should pray that all evil plans might be frustrated and that all who persist in evil should be stopped and in the end be judged. If we do not feel this way, it is probably an indication that we are not very sim sensitive to sinful acts and have little concern for those who are victimized by them. David wants God to prove that the way of the ungodly does not succeed. Notice that he is not praying for the final judgment of the wicked by which they are to be consigned to hell, but rather that he is praying for a proper, present recompense to them for the evil they are doing. In our terms, what he is praying for is that those who are looking on from the outside will see that crime does not, or in this case, evil does not pay. Listen to me, saints of God. We live in an evil, corrupt, wicked world. 
We live in a world that is, that is advocating for drag queens in the elementary schools of our nation. While at the same time calling a conservative Christian the threat to the fiber of our nation. We are living in upside down, wicked, evil, turbulent times. But listen to me. It's not enough just to know that. Information about the wickedness abounds. Just a few minutes in any news feed of any news service that you want to read on your phone, you will find plenty of wickedness to moan and bemoan and complain about. It's not enough just to know about wickedness. We must do something about it. We must do something about it. We must do it by living good for God according to His words and calling for a holy standard for God's people and calling out evil that's going on in our world. Not in the hateful speech the way that the world can do it, but instead no longer tolerating sin. No longer tolerating it when it happens. Finding ways to speak up and to stand up for good. To speak up and to stand up for right and the things that are right. That is what David is doing. David wasn't just consigning people that do evil to hell and hoping they'd all go away. He wanted things to change. And you and I should want the same thing also. David believed that their wickedness was so corrupt that he went on at the end of verse 5 to say this, speaking of God, God shall destroy them and not build them up. Ultimately, wickedness will be judged. But in the meantime, our job is to reach as many unsaved people as we possibly can. And we can't do it just by screaming at the darkness. We have to be far more godly than that. Anybody can scream at the darkness. But instead, we must show the love of God, stand for what is right and true, to be articulate about the things that uh, are right and true, and to have the conviction to go to places where necessary to stand up for them. We've got to stop being silent, folks. There's nothing godly. Oh, they'll, I'll win them by the love that I show them. No, your, your silence is not. Now, sometimes I know our culture says silence is golden. And I've listened to some people talk for hours, and I wish they'd exercise that. <laughs> or let me go, one of the two. I don't know, you know. But you and I need to speak up. For the things that are right and true. Number three, praising. Here, praising begins in verse number six. Here, it's specifically about praising the Lord who hears prayers. Let's look in verse six and seven. Blessed be the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplication. Notice here that David went from, from David went, uh, David now is singing instead of crying before God. Instead of calling on God and bemoaning what's going on, he's now beginning to praise the Lord, to rejoice. In God. And it is not even specific here in the text. We don't know that his prayer was even answered. We don't know that God had even turned the enemy around yet. He began to rejoice just simply on the one fact that God heard him when he cried. That God heard his prayers. And that was enough to cause him to break out in praise to God. Because, he says here, blessed be the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplication. Verse 7 says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. Because of that answer to prayer and the response of praise, David now makes this declaration as the Lord is my strength and shield. Charles Spurgeon, in commenting about this verse, said this, My dear friend, if you can say the Lord is my strength, you can bear anything and everything. You could bear a martyr's death if the Lord should be your strength. He could even make a stalk of wheat bear up the whole world if he strengthened it, end quote. The, you and I need to realize that it's the Lord that is our strength. It is the Lord that is our shield. It is the Lord that are those things to us. He goes on in verse 7 and says, my heart trusted in God and I am helped. Here's another verse to show the benefits of trusting in God. When you trust God, you will never go wrong. God 
will always shine himself upon you. He keeps going here. He says, therefore, my heart greatly rejoices, and with my song, I will praise him. David went from crying before the Lord to praising God simply because he called on God, and God heard his prayer, and God heard his cry. Fourth is this. The fourth one is also praise. Here specifically, praise the Lord who is the strength of his people. Let's look at verse 8. It says, the Lord is their strength and he is the saving refuge of his anointing. This is the blessing that's given to the heart that trusts God because he becomes their strength in their life. Then David says this in verse 9. Save your people. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Shepherd them also and bear them up forever. The beginning of this chapter started with a plea for personal help and personal rescue. But now at the end of this chapter, David's concern is for God's people. For all of them as a whole. He calls on verse 9 for God on behalf of God's people. He says this, number one, save. He says, save your people. God's people needed to be rescued. And they were looking to God and David was asking God to save them. Then he said, and bless your inheritance. He asked them to shepherd. It says here in verse 9, shepherd them also. We need the care, the guidance, the leading of our shepherd, Jesus. It's very interesting when you study that word shepherd in the Hebrew. Ra is the word. Signifies both to feed and to govern. Feed them as a shepherd does his flock and rule them as a father does his children. We need that from the Lord, don't we? We need his guidance. We need him to feed us and to govern us. And then he says this, and bear them up forever and bear them up. I need that most days, don't you? I need God to bear me up. I need him to carry me. There are some things that have come my way that were so painful that if it wasn't for the arms of God to carry me, I don't know that I could have made it. But his arms were there and he did carry me and I did make it. You see, when you and I pray earnestly before God and we receive our answers from God, we should do two things in response to that. First, we should thank God. Thank God. I do find it interesting that people will wear out the door of the pastor's office needing an answer from God. Then when the answer comes, we never hear from them. We don't. You know what we do? We take the prayer list after we've not heard from you in a reasonable amount of time and call you and say, Hey, how's it going with your prayer request? We've been praying for it each and every day. Oh, weeks ago, God took care of that. We're like, okay. Been nice to know. Not for clerical reasons. Been nice to know so we could celebrate with you or rejoice. But it could also be the indication of a deeper issue. That we only turn to God when we need things. Because a lack of gratitude shows a willingness to use God for His power and benefit, but not to love Him in return the way we should. We're to be grateful people. And second, we should then, when we receive our answers to prayer, expand our prayers to requests that other believers and sisters have, asking God to benefit them with answers to prayer. That's why Pastor and I go out of our way on the prayer chain to make prayer needs known. We go out of our way in pastoral prayer time to share prayer needs and to ask you to pray. We go out of our way to reach out to you and ask you how it's going and pray with you on the phone or in the foyer or around the altar or in the parking lot as you leave. Because we realize the importance of this aspect of prayer. In closing tonight, I want to read what F.B. Myers, one of my, actually one of my more favorite, what I refer to as the old dead preachers from many years ago. He wrote a commentary and in his chapter on Psalms 28 was, it was good, but this is the best part of it. 
He said, Jesus does not simply lead us to green pastures and still waters. He bears us up, and He does so forever. Never tiring, though He imparts infinite rest. Never ceasing for a moment His shepherd care of you and I. But I want to ask you tonight, though, in a way of responding to this message, to ask yourself, what will I do with Psalms 28? I know a lot of times I give you something real specific. Some of you just looked at me when you read that on a page and went, could you be a little more vague, Pastor Jonathan? The point here is this. Don't leave God's house without coming up with what you're going to do, without asking God, without looking into this time of prayer and saying, when we're done with this prayer, what can I walk away with to do about Psalms 28? Is it to have a better attitude toward God, to not only ask of Him, but also regularly thank Him for what He's doing in your life? Maybe this psalm has evoked in you some level of, I've been a little too quiet about some of the evil going on at my grandchild's school. I want to see what I can do to get involved uh, and see what I can do to make a difference. I don't know what it is. It could be anything, but something must be done. We are to not hear God's Word, but also do the Word of God. And I like the Sunday night, I like all the crowds, but Sunday night crowd, you guys are some mature people, and I'm not talking about your age that's on your driver's license. Mature in the faith. You're here because you want to be here. You're here because you want to learn from God. You're here because you want to make a difference. You're here because you want to know what to do. And you're here because you see, you're saying to God loud and clear, I love you, God, and I want my life to matter while I'm on this earth. And so to that pursuit, let's ask God tonight, what is it, God, from Psalms 28 that I am to do beginning tonight? Beginning right now, not later, not put on my to-do list to get around to. Beginning now, what will I do with Psalms 28? Let me help you with that by giving us a time of prayer. Let's close our eyes, bow our heads, and let's just begin to have a time of prayer now. Father, we love you and we thank you. I am ever so grateful, God, for your word, for the timeliness of it. I don't know, but that every single time I preach, either online to somebody watching or someone in the crowd, that I'll get a text or a phone call or something that says, Pastor, that was just right on time for me in my life. So, Father, I'm asking you for those that needed this on-time word, let them be blessed by your word tonight. But beyond that, for all of us, God, give us a call to action. We're not going to sit back and say, well, I'll do it when God tells me what to do. No, we, we're taking responsibility, God, for what you said to hear the word and do the word. So what is it that we need to do, God? What is it that you would have of each and every one of us to do with Psalms 28? Specifically, passionately, what can we do, God? Help us with that, we pray, God. In your name we pray. Amen.